Please take your seats. Good morning, all, and a very warm welcome to you to the Elson Andrews Parish Church this morning for our morning service. Thank you for joining us. Thank you also to those who are online who may be joining us this morning from a variety of parts around the world. We know that some of you don't join us live, but perhaps catch up later on in the week. But nevertheless, our welcome to you is sincere. We do hope that you are able to stay behind after the service this morning because in the large hall there's an opportunity to share in tea and coffee and further fellowship. And while you're there, also you might like to have a look at the booklet that's been produced by a group, a writing group that meets in our premises on a regular basis called Pen Pals. They've produced some poetry and some prose. Uh, there's a suggested donation if you would like to buy one of the books of five pounds and all the proceeds are going to support the work of St. Andrew's Hospice in Airdrie. A great cause. So do have a look while you're through in the hall this morning. We were very sad to hear the news um, just today of the death of Jean McEwen, an elderly member of our congregation who lived in Brandon Court. Sadly, Jean has died. Um, she was in Wisher General Hospital. She was a very faithful member of our congregation, and I would commend to your prayers our daughter Christine and our sister Carol. This afternoon there's a service in Glenview Court. That's at 3 o'clock. It's open to residents there, but also to others as well to come and share in worship. It's uh, the last one of our series of monthly services in the complex, and today we'll share in Holy Communion. So you're very welcome to join us if you're available at 3 o'clock. And finally, just to say congratulations to the team of Robert Crow, John Curry, Ian McKenzie, and Charlie Richmond, who managed to bring home the Brogan Trophy, which is the men's club bowling trophy. We had a few of our men's club, a few teams or rinks or whatever they're called, I'm not a bowler, um, in the competition, but we're very glad that these four men brought home the trophy. It's a few years, I think, since we won this trophy, and it's a very splendid trophy indeed. So congratulations to those who competed, and particularly to the four who were able to bring home this beautiful trophy. We'll find an appropriate place for it. Oh, there's a lovely photograph on the screens that I've just spotted of the winning team. Well done to all concerned. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Psalms, a book which we'll be revisiting in our sermon this morning, from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Young and old, large and small, all are welcome in the house of the Lord as we come to bring him our worship and our praise. Hymn number 132 from the church hymnary is our opening item of praise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise.
Let's come together to God and share in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal, almighty, and most gracious God, heaven is your throne, and earth is your footstool. You are praised by the heavenly host of angels and in the congregation of your people here on earth. You are worthy of all the praise, adoration, and blessing which is given to you. For you are the Lord. You have made the earth and all that lives in it. You are the Savior of all who call on your name with sincere repentance and true humility. We are sinful, unworthy creatures formed from the dust of the earth. We choose our own selfish path far too often rather than the way of blessing you set before us in Christ. Yet, in his name and through his grace and mercy, we're invited to present our requests to you, asking that you will smile upon us with your love. Pardon our waywardness and restore our souls, we pray. Holy God, without you we have nothing of real and lasting value. Yet through faith in your Son we enjoy fullness of life. Attentive to your word of command with reverent spirits, help us to be obedient to Jesus. May we follow his example of a godly life lived in the service of others and to the glory of your name. Through baptism in your Holy Spirit, let us be inspired by your word, fervent in prayer and joyful in praise. And may others come to know Christ as Savior and Lord through the lives that we lead. Through the blessing of your nearer presence, may we be ever thankful that one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. For we live to praise your name now and always. Amen. We sing to God's glory again. This time, this song comes from the Mission Praise Book. Give me a sight, O Savior, of thy wondrous love to me, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. And the refrain is a plea that God will open up his word to us and reveal his presence. So make me understand it. Help me to take it in, what it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin.
we turn to the Old Testament for our Bible reading for this morning and to the book of Psalms, there in Psalm 2. We're going to read the whole of the psalm, which is only 12 verses long, so it's one of the shorter ones. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He rebukes them in His anger and terrifies them in His wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you be destroyed in your way, for His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Amen. And we give thanks to God for this reading from His Word. We shall return to those verses in just a moment. But before we do, we sing another song of our salvation another song to our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this comes from the Mission Praise Book, but I think it'll be familiar to many of you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
I guess if I were to do a survey of this congregation as to what your favorite Bible passage or your favorite Bible book might be, that a fair proportion of you would probably come up with the book of Psalms. I guess listening to people over the years in pastoral situations, people have told me many, many times just how precious the particular writings in this book have become to them. Uh, there are times of celebration in the book, and there are times of sadness. At 150 chapters, Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. With 176 verses, it also has the longest chapter. Psalm 119, not necessarily one that you would like to come upon in your daily readings because it might take you a bit longer than the rest do, but it's filled with some great stuff nevertheless. It also has the shortest book in the whole of Holy Scripture, and that is Psalm 117, the shortest chapter, I should say, because it's only got two verses. The Psalms is really a collection of prayers, of poems, of prose, of praises, which has served God's people well down through many centuries. Although it's largely associated with the name of David, the shepherd boy who became king of Israel, there were some of the Psalms were penned by other people. For example, Moses penned a couple of the Psalms. And Solomon. The sons of Korah are mentioned, as is Asaph. Asaph was the worship leader during the time of David's reign. Many of the Psalms resulted from personal piety, from deliberate individual experience, but others were written to express national identity. Uh, the Jewish nation would often sing the Psalms and in different forms, both old from the Psalter and new from different compositions that have been formed recently, we still sing the Psalms. In fact, sometimes you won't even realize that you are singing the words of the Psalms. They're used for repentance. If you are feeling particularly convicted of something in your life and you just don't have the words to express it, then you could do worse than go to Psalm 51, which is David's great psalm of confession, where he feels, rightly so, that he has let God down in an incredibly embarrassing way. If you are not at that place in your life, if you're at a place of celebration where you're thankful for the goodness of God, then you could do worse than go to the very final psalm in the book, Psalm 150 which talks about all range of instruments that are used to praise God, uh, right through the ones that are quiet to the ones that are really quite loud, like the clashing of cymbals. So the Psalms, undoubtedly, is a well-known and an extensive and a regularly studied section of Scripture. I always say to people that um, if you want to find the Psalms, uh, and you're unsure, then a nice easy way to do it is just to take your Bible, stick your thumbs in roughly in the middle of the pages there, and open it up, and you're almost certainly going to be in the book of Psalms, as we are this morning reading Psalm 2. But you might already be thinking, why is Derek telling us all of this, and what relevance does a study in the Psalms have to a general series that we're following entitled Essential Jesus. Because even the latest of the Psalms was probably written around 600 years before Jesus was born at Bethlehem. The Psalms were written over a period of about a thousand years. The Jews believed that it probably was Ezra the prophet who drew together for the first time this large collection of psalms that we have in our possession today. And even that was 450 years before Christ. So, 
how does what we're reading in the Psalms relate to what we're reading about Jesus, about Christ? The first thing to say that's important is that the New Testament quotes from the Psalms more than any other book in the Old Testament. So that makes it especially important. There are almost a hundred direct quotations in the New Testament which are lifted from the Psalms. And Jesus himself quoted from the Psalms on many occasions. He must have, as a Jewish boy being brought up in the local synagogue, have committed to heart, I suppose, many of the Psalms, because he referred to them on so many occasions, including when he was dying on the cross. Remember those words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words come directly out of Psalm 22 which we're going to look at next week. So Jesus quoted from the Psalms. There are lots of other references to the Psalms in the New Testament, and therefore, from my point of view, I think that makes it well worth going into the Psalms and thinking about what they might have to say to us about Jesus. So what does the book of Psalms say about Jesus? Well, it might be an odd question to consider. But it's precisely why I've entitled this sermon, if you've seen a sheet this morning, Christ in the Rear View Mirror. The book of Psalms isn't only an intensely personal book, it's also an intentionally prophetic book. And by prophetic, I mean that it was looking forward to a time beyond the generation in which those words were actually written. If we read the text closely, if we consider it prayerfully, then we'll see that much of what is written, particularly in certain Psalms, refers to the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. The Psalms that point us in particular to Jesus and His ministry are often referred to as Messianic Psalms. And there are at least 14 of those out of the 150 that we have. We're not going to study all 14, but we are going to look at four of them. We start today with thinking about Psalm 2, and then we move on next Sunday to think about Psalm 22, and then in due course, Psalms 69 and 118. But first of all, Psalm 2. If ever we saw the relevance of Scripture, something that was written many, many years ago, today, and for the circumstances that we face in our world, Psalm 2 is a good example of that. It begins with a question in verse 1. Why do the nations conspire, or that can also be translated rage, and the peoples plot in vain? In verses 2 through 4, it then goes on to contrast the futility of those who take a stand against God and how God laughs and scoffs at this challenge to His authority. In amongst those verses is an important phrase for our understanding of the role that's played by Jesus. The words, His anointed one are mentioned there in the text. And they're a reference to the Messiah, which is a Hebrew word, or the Christ, which is a Greek word. But basically what it's talking about is the one that God promised to send into the world in order to sort things out, to put everything right again. So Jesus, we believe, is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And we're on solid ground when we believe that, because that's precisely what his earliest followers, the first disciples, believed. How do I know that? If you look in your own Bibles at Acts chapter 4, verse 23 and following, 
you will see there that Peter and John came up against opposition to their preaching. And when they did, they referred back to this particular verse or verses in the book of Psalms, and they talked about Jesus as being the Messiah or the Christ. He was the one that God was going to send to save the people from their sin. The Sanhedrin, which was the ruling religious authority of the day, had ordered Peter and John to stop talking about Jesus and to stop saying that he was the Savior, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ. Instead, what they did was they quoted from Psalm 2, they prayed together, and they declared the message even more boldly than they had done before. So, where's the relevance of Psalm 2? It starts with this contrast between the attitude of the world and the attitude of those who want to follow Jesus. The world rages against the thought that they cannot solve their own problems and that they have to bow the knee to God. But those who follow Jesus say, no, He is the Messiah, He is the Christ, He is the Anointed One, spoken of in Psalm 2. He is the one who has come to save us from our sin and from ourselves. And even in our modern world, that contrast still exists. Those who honor God, God honors. Those who have no place for God in their lives, either as individuals or as a community, even as a nation, are on shaky ground. They are in very great danger. One of the great reasons, I believe, for the downfall, for example, of the USSR, the former United Soviet Socialist Republic, was their active rejection of faith in God. They taught an atheistic communism that left no place for Christ. And they are no longer been split up into all of these little nation states. Hold in contrast to that, one of the glories of our present queen is her genuine and sincere personal belief in Jesus Christ as God's Son and Savior. There she is as the sovereign in our land, and yet she, by her own words, is willing to bow the knee to one whom she recognizes as greater than she is. And as you look across the world, irrespective of which political hue a country turns to, whether it be conservative or liberal or nationalist or socialist, when reverence is given to God Almighty, then God's blessing is upon that nation. And when it is not, then it is in grave danger. It's not good enough with Alistair Campbell, the former spin doctor of New Labour, and an advisor at that time to Prime Minister Tony Blair, to say, we don't do God. That was the famous quotation. That's simply not good enough. So as well as individuals having to bow the knee to God in Christ, I believe what the Bible is teaching is that nations and governments also are subject to His sovereignty. There is only one Messiah, Psalm 2 teaches us. Only one person who can stand between man and God and form a link and a bridge God sent him to save the world from itself. There's a couple of other things that I want to say about Psalm 2. 
Verses 6 and 7 say this, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. You are my son. Today I have become your father. That's got a familiar ring to it. At least I think it does. It sounds very like the words that came from heaven after the baptism of Jesus by John in the River Jordan, doesn't it? This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And those words were spoken again at the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountaintop. Those words are repeated in three out of the four Gospels that we have. And they very much echo these words in Psalm 2. Now, why am I making that point? I'll tell you why. It's really important. To me, it's a wonderful thing that the words which are spoken in Psalm 2 are then echoed by God of Jesus, His Son, at His baptism and at His transfiguration. What that says to me is that God has no plan B. From the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us. It was God's desire and promise to save us from ourselves. Despite constant warnings through the centuries which were brought to us in the ministry of the prophets, it was always going to culminate in the giving of a sacrificial lamb, spotless, perfect. The Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son that's mentioned in Psalm 2. He and only He came to save us from our sin. So Psalm 2 speaks about Jesus being a sovereign King to whom we must subject ourselves. It speaks about Him being a suffering Savior to whom we must confess our sins. And it talks about Him as being the Son of the living God. And verse 12 talks about Him as being the Son who must be kissed. Can I have another slide, please, Colin? Colin, would you advance that one? Oh, thank you. You beat me to it. The Son who must be kissed. What's that a reference to in verse 12 there? Well, it's actually very straightforward, but it's also very beautiful. The word worship, the English word worship, was originally associated with the phrase to come towards and kiss. In ancient times, one of the outward signs of an important person was that they would wear a big fancy ring on their finger. It normally or often doubled as a seal for official documents, actually. But as that important person had their subjects approach them, the subjects would bow down and would kiss the ring in deference to the person's elevated position in society. The moderator of the General Assembly, the Church of Scotland, wears a ring. I've yet to see somebody bow down and kiss that particular ring right enough. But to come towards the person to kiss the ring, or just the hand for that matter, is to give that person their place. And it's in that way that we ought to approach Christ. When we come to worship Him in a very personal and beautiful and wonderful way, we come towards Him to embrace Him, to kiss the Son. He is our sovereign. He's our King. He is our Savior, but He is also the Son of God. He's worthy of our worship, our adoration, and our praise. Of course, all thoughts of a kiss perhaps resonate with the story of Jesus. We bring to mind the betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
when Judas Iscariot approached him and kissed him. It's about the story that we thought about last week, if you were here on Sunday morning with us, contrasts nicely with that. It was of, do you remember, the sinful woman who anointed Jesus, whose tears wet his feet, whose hair she used to dry his feet. She was bringing her adoration and her praise to him, recognizing that he was the sovereign, the savior, and the son. And helpfully, that brings us full circle in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a prophetic psalm. It's a messianic psalm. It looks forward to a time beyond itself when the world will be in turmoil, raging against God, believing, however, that they're fireproof, that they can solve their own problems without recourse to faith in an invisible guy in the sky. I don't know how many times that's appeared in my social media, that particular phrase, or oh, you believe in an invisible guy in the sky. Well, I tell you, it's to that guy that I bring my worship and my thanks every day because he set me free from the hold that sin can have on me. And he's shown me that there's a better way, not only for me, but for the world to live. In Christ, God holds out to the world hope. All we need to do is to kiss his hand, take his hand, and go forward following where he leads. Amen. We continue our worship as we bring to God our offering. The offering will now be uplifted. Thank you. 
We bring our prayers of thanks to God, and we also pray for those around us in our country and in our world. Let us pray. God of love, we offer these gifts, small though they are. We offer our worship, imperfect though it may be. We offer our faith, weak though it sometimes is. We offer our love, poor though it seems compared to yours. God of love, Take all we offer this day, flawed though we know it to be, and use it in ways beyond our imagination for the extension of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Living God, we pray for those around us in our world and for ourselves. We pray for all who are weighed down by the stresses and strains of daily life, those who long for peace of mind, who crave rest for their souls but cannot find it. We pray for those oppressed and dominated by worry, unable to throw off their anxieties, held captive by a multitude of secret fears. We pray for those who cannot let go, those who find it impossible to relax or unwind, always fretting over this and that. We pray for those who lose themselves in busyness, masking their true feelings, running from their emptiness, hoping that somehow keeping active will bring them that elusive happiness. We pray for those who do not make time for you, allowing the pressures and demands of each day to shut you out, putting any thought of you off until tomorrow. Living God, Speak to each one of these in your still small voice, we pray. Grant them your peace, which passes understanding, the quiet confidence only you can bring to a life, and the refreshing of their souls. King of the ages, in this weekend of national celebrations, we recognize and rejoice in the Christian example set by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. As we have sung many times, you have truly saved her. But we pray that you will also continue to bless her at this special time. And through her faithfulness, be pleased to honor the people of these islands whom she dutifully serves as sovereign. We pray also that you will ever remind those in authority over us who are called to govern wisely and well that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. And so let truth and justice prevail in the corridors of power at Edinburgh, in London, and on the continent. And may the needs of all, rather than that of a few privileged people, be at the heart of discussions, debates, and decisions in church and in community, here and across the world. In everything we do and say, and even what we think, may we honor Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. In his
His name we pray. Amen. Now the children are going to join us. It will take a few moments for them to gather and to tell us what they've been doing in their various groups. Um, and it's been a couple of weeks, really, since I've had a chance to speak to you, because last week we were celebrating communion in here while you were in your classes, and the week before that was a holiday. Who was away? Were you away? Yeah, about three of you. Good. Okay. And then it was pretty busy with baptisms before that, wasn't it? We had several baptisms on succeeding Sundays. So that was brilliant as well to welcome new wee little ones into our church family. But it's great to see you this morning. I know that over the past few weeks, um, even when I'm not the chance to speak to you, that you've been thinking about something very special. Ten rules from God. What's the other word apart from rules? Who can tell me? What are they called, Ian? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, that's right. And I think that if I'm right, today you've got to number six. And number six, well, can anybody tell me what it says? What does it say, Abigail? What does it say? You can read that up there if you like. That's okay. Life is a precious precious gift. Yeah, precious. That's a hard word for somebody your age, isn't it? So well done. That was great. Life is a precious gift. But what the commandment actually says is that we've not to murder. But of course, what it means is Not just that we're not to do harm to people, but that we're to be nice to people, that we're to do good to people. And I think there was a story that you were finding out about today about two people. Who can tell me a wee bit about the story today, Ewan? Um, I forgot. Who were the two people? Can you remember their names? No. No? That's okay. That's okay. Can anybody remember their names? Jessica, can you remember? No. No. Kayla? Adam and Eve. Well, Adam and Eve were involved, but it was Adam and Eve's sons I'm thinking about. What were they called? Do you know, Callum? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. That's right. Well done. That was an excellent answer from one of our younger children. There they are. Two brothers, Cain and Abel. And I don't know that this is what they looked like, but the picture amused me when I saw it. I found this picture and I thought, well, that's quite nice. Cain was a farmer who looked after the crops, and Abel was a farmer too, but he looked after the animals. And they both brought an offering to God to say thank you to God, but there was something else happened, something really, really bad. Let's see if Adam knows what happened that was really bad in this story, Adam? Um, the naughty brother killed yeah. his other brother. Well done, Adam. What an excellent answer. The naughty brother killed his other brother. That's right. Cain got very angry with Abel. You see, he was quite jealous because it said that God was pleased with one of the brothers' offering but not so pleased with the other one. 
Cain got so jealous with his brother Abel that he killed him. That's a terrible thing to do, isn't it? It's a dreadful thing to do. And of course, you were thinking about that story today because of this number six commandment. There it is again, which says life is a precious gift. We've not to murder anybody. We've not to hurt anybody. So if we've not to murder anybody, we've not to hurt anybody like Cain did with his brother Abel, what are we to do? We have to do that. We have to be kind and we have to be helpful. I wonder if you can give me some examples. How can we be kind and helpful rather than hurtful? Come on then, Brody. What can we do to be kind and helpful? Uh, we shall... Go on. It's all right. Go on, say it. We shall wash sweeties. We should share our sweeties. Well, do you know, Brody, I'm really glad that you said that. That would have been a really hard thing for me to say, an even harder thing to do, because I like my sweeties, but I'm sure so do you. But you're absolutely right. That would be a kind and a helpful thing to do, to share your sweeties. Cameron? If somebody was hurt, you help them. Well done. If somebody was hurt, maybe if they'd fallen and had scraped their knee or something like that, then you might help them. Now, if you're at school, you might take them to the office in the school for the ladies to help them, maybe to put a plaster on it or something like that. That's a very good way to be kind and helpful. You? Um, maybe you should, um, if, someone does, if someone wants to play your game and someone won't let them play it, um, you should let them play the game that you're playing after if they, you're playing the same game. Excellent. That's excellent. What you're saying, isn't that very good? You and you're saying that nobody should be left out. I think that's what you're saying. Is that right? So if you're all playing a game and somebody's standing over at the side and you see that they're left out, then you go over and you say to them, would you like to play with us? That's a wonderful thing to do, a very kind, a very helpful thing. Abigail, have you got something? Help your mother and father. What was that, sorry? Help your mother and father. Very good. Help your mum and dad. Yes, sometimes they need help. Do you know what? Sometimes it's a real struggle to be a mummy or a daddy. You've got so much to do. And it would be really good if the boys and girls helped them as well. Come on then, Samantha. Play with each other. Play with each other. Absolutely. And I think, Luke, at the back, did you have your hand up? Let me come and just check out what you wanted to say. How can we be kind and helpful? Helping each other. Helping each other. That's right. You've got it. Exactly. Adam. If someone's pushed you on the floor, you get them back up. If someone gets pushed on the floor, then you help them back up. Yes? Uh, Damien keeps hurting me. Damien keeps hurting you. <laughs> Talk about being named and shamed in the church. <laughs> Where is Damien? You're hiding. Listen, Damien, you need to pay attention to the sixth commandment. Named and shamed. Be nice. Let me pass. Let me pass. Cameron? You should always help your friends. You should always help your friends. And sometimes even people who are not your friends. Callum? Uh, if somebody doesn't want to play a game with us, let them not. Well, that's right. You don't force somebody to play with you. So that's a good thought, too. And Jessica? If you want, if you want to go into somebody's house, just play with your toys. Yeah, you can go and share somebody's toys. That's lovely. What nice ideas. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there, Bethany. Can I get in there? Thank you. Right, Bethany. You should always love your friends. You should always love people, shouldn't you? And that's exactly what this commandment's saying. And that's what Cain didn't do. Cain was nasty to his brother Abel. I mean, really, that was not a good thing to do, was it, boys and girls? So God doesn't want us to be nasty to people. He wants us to be nice to them. He certainly doesn't want us to kill them or hurt them. He wants us to be kind and helpful. So I hope that you'll remember that from today's story. And you've certainly reminded all of the, the adults here what that story of Cain and Abel is all about. So well done, you. Shall we share in a prayer before we finish with our final song? Let's close our eyes. Just listen if you want you to say amen at the end.
God, we thank you for these children in our Sunday school and infusion Bible class. We thank you for all the things that they're learning about you and about the good things to follow the example of Jesus. Help them and help us as adults too to put these things into practice and to care for others so that no one is left out, but everyone knows that they're important to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. That was super, giving me all of that help this morning. Thank you so much. We're going to finish our service by singing a song that says who's the most important person to all of us in our church family, and that's Jesus. pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, both now and forevermore.